Wonderful. All right, welcome everyone. This is Derek Shields. I serve as the director of the National Disability Mentoring Coalition, and I will be your host for the next 90 minutes as we talk about entrepreneurship and a few other topics today. Um, as you, uh, if you're if you're joining us through webinar, we have our panelists in the video mode. Um, if you're on telephone, we'll do our best to describe the environment as we go through some slides for today's meeting. Um, we have a, a fairly full agenda, um, but so I'd be remiss if we didn't start out today with a moment to um, reflect a little bit on the passing of one of our loved ones. Uh, Janelle, can you go to the next slide? Thanks. So this is what we're going to get into, a little bit of reflections. I have a couple of things I'm going to read, and then um, I'll introduce our panelists to focus on entrepreneurship models and resources to support mentees. Um, this is an area that I'm personally quite interested in because I've struggled in this when talking to mentees about entrepreneurship and self-employment as an option in transition to work. Um, we have a couple items at the end after a panel discussion. Um, to focus on some mentoring coalition business. We, importantly, will update you on the Disability Mentoring Hall of Fame, and then um, any other updates that you might have. Um, most of us have probably seen some content online, but one of our dear um, founding members of the Mentoring Coalition and longtime colleague, Barbara Butts, passed away in November. And um, if, if you're not familiar with Barbara, um, she, um, and her organization, Policy Works, had a significant um, involvement in, of why I'm involved. Um, about eight years ago, I was a board member for Barbara's organization, Policy Works, and we did a national scan to invest some funds that were in the Susan Daniels Mentorship Fund. And um, Susan had passed away, and it was Barbara's um, partner. And um, Policy Works was the steward of this money. And I scanned the country and, in fact, uh, the world around disability mentoring and um, presented um, a, an organization of choice to invest that mentorship money in. And uh, the board approved that recommendation, and thus a, a seed grant was provided to Partners for Youth with Disabilities to create an online mentoring platform. Um, that relationship led to me knowing the folks at Partners for Youth with Disabilities, including Janelle Thomas and Regina Snowden. Over time, that led to the establishment of the Disability Mentoring Coalition itself, which PolicyWorks continued to support. So Barbara was a dear friend of many people on the phone, including Terry Hartman Squire, who released a, a really wonderful um, almost poem about the life and impact of a friend and a colleague, Barbara. Um, and you can find that pretty easily online if you look for it. Um, what I'd like to do today is actually to share a few reactions to the, to the um, piece that Terry and a few of us wrote. Um, and we'll start our meeting with this as a, in remembering Barbara. Um, the first one is from John Kemp, a longtime friend and colleague of Barbara's. John writes, Barbara was a brilliant advocate and extraordinarily devoted to social justice and disability rights. I'm so saddened by her passing and extend our condolences. Another leader has moved on. Darn. And from Marcy Roth, now the executive director at the World Institute on Disability. Oh, no, not our wonderful Barbara. What an amazing leader and friend. You made a big difference in many lives and you will be missed. Rest in power. And from Regina Snowden, who's with us today, I was fortunate to know her, to be a recipient of her vision of mentoring. I know you knew her much more so than I, and your words are very near and dear. Thank you. And the last one from a childhood friend. Her name is Pam Carl. And I, you know, most of us knew Barbara from the last 20 years, but not from her childhood. Barbara was a childhood best friend, poet, advisor, secret sharer, secret keeper, and refuge from high school angst. We came of age together. As a lifelong friend, joy is sorrow turned inside out. Feeling joy to have had you in my life, feeling sorrow at your passing too soon, still not quite grasping that, always in my heart. Love you always, Pam. So with that, we are reinforced that Barbara left 
legacy in all of us and asks us to move forward with mentorship and driving full inclusion for the next generation of leaders to include more young people and young adults with disabilities. It was Barbara's lifelong passion to remove barriers to real careers for people with disabilities. And I think it connects to why entrepreneurship might be a, a great opportunity. So we'll, we'll use her legacy to motivate our session today to create entrepreneurship opportunities for more folks in the country. Um, so I'm going to have to take a deep breath now. <sighs> okay, I got that done. And now let's turn to our agenda. And it, so it's our honor to have our three presenters with us today. We have Colleen Prespino, uh, Diego Mariscal, and Alex, Alec Frazier with us. Um, Alec is holding the awesome lightsaber. So thank you for bringing that with us. Um, so uh, each one is going to provide about 15 minutes worth of comments, and then we'll have at the end uh, an open, open discussion. Um, so I'll introduce uh, Colleen first, and then hold off on introductions of Diego and Alec to where they are up. Uh, Colleen is a chief program officer at the Viscardi Center and his principal responsibility for overseeing all of the Abilities Inc. employment, day habilitation without walls, and youth-related programs and services, as well as other key Viscardi Center initiatives. This includes the management of the National Center for Disability Entrepreneurship, the Nas National Disability and Dis sorry, National Business and Disability Council, and Project Accessible or Oral Health. Um, Colleen has a, a career of about 27 years dedicated to the inclusion of people with disabilities in the workforce, and we're lucky to have her join us today to talk about one of the newer Viscardi Center initiatives. And with that, let's move the slides forward, and I'll turn it over to you, Colleen. Thank you very much. Um, that was a lovely introduction. Um, and just for those of you that don't know the Viscardi Center, I'll just tell you a little bit. We're a, a a network of three nonprofits, including a school um, for students with very significant physical disabilities and um, medical um, issues, as well as serving youth and adults, um, for the most part in employment, but in other areas as well. We also serve veterans and a couple of other um, underserved um, groups. So um, I have been with the Viscardi Center for a little more than two years, and it's really a, a great, amazing place. So um, when I got here, one of the first things that John Kemp, our CEO, who I know some of you know, uh, said to me is, we really should have an entrepreneurship program and it should be national. And I said, okay, I've been working in employment for people with disabilities for my whole career, but I have not really focused on entrepreneurship. I'm not an entrepreneur myself. Um, so I kind of set out to figure out what was out there and what we could do. And what I really found was that there was a big void um, in uh, entrepreneurship programs for people with disabilities. There had been some that had been funded by ODEP um, that had lasted for three years or four years, um, and all of their information was public, but they didn't have funding to continue. So I already realized the sustainability of these kinds of programs would be an issue. Um, I did come across some of the programs of some of the other people that are here, including Diego, um, and also the um, Chicago um, Seed. Um, you know, we came across their stuff as well, but everybody was sort of struggling with the same kind of issues. You know, how do you get the resources to actually make these things um, work? So why entrepreneurship for us? If you could just advance the slide. We kind of look at, we've been involved in the here at Viscardi with the traditional model. So you know, and the traditional model, you know, we're almost 20 years out from, from the passage of the ADA now, and we've made such little progress in employment um, in traditional settings, and we're still seeing, you know, uh, labor force for people with disabilities, they're lagging significantly behind people without disabilities. Um, you know, really the unemployment rate is at least twice, I think it's probably more than that, um, the, you know, people without disabilities and people are really struggling. And then in some of the research that we did, it became evident that there were some people that were going into self-employment or entrepreneurship who were really doing it as a last resort. They tried to find jobs, they couldn't find jobs, and they said, I'll start my own job, or their family said, we'll start a company and we'll employ you. So it became obvious that 
first of all, entrepreneurship should be a choice that's offered to people. It shouldn't just be a default. Um, and for those who really feel like that's the only direction they have, there should be supports and services available to them. So that is really what we set out to do. And if you look globally, um, as we tried to do, um, you know, people with disabilities are really succeeding um, across the globe in self-employment for a whole host of reasons. Um, you know, so it became really important for us to be able to try to figure out how do we take all the best practices from what people had learned and kind of build something that we thought was going to work um, for people. So if you could just go to the next slide. So our vision really was um, to provide a strategic pathway to combat the barriers that lead to such widespread unemployment and underemployment. And I listed just a handful of them here, and I think Everybody here probably knows all of these plus a whole bunch more. So, you know, there's still the battle with employer attitudes um, and accessibility, transportation, financial, personal financial considerations for people. Um, do they have money to start their own businesses? What, what will the impact be on their benefits and entitlements? What are their own personal care needs and how do they get those things met? So we wanted to be able to create a program that took all of these things into account um, and helped people find solutions um, that could help move them forward. So it was really important for us to be able to not just provide entrepreneurship, which is interesting too, because when you look across the country, there are so many entrepreneurship programs. If you are a woman, if you are somebody in a minority group, um, you can find an entrepreneurship program in your community. You'll find training, you'll find an accelerator, an incubator, you'll find something. Um, but so few of them are, um, you know, have any expertise helping people with disabilities. And I was actually kind of struck as I was logging into the webinar that the, um, the password was inclusion for all, because the very first um, experience I had with entrepreneurship, I attended a conference called Entrepreneurship for All, and it was in um, Boston. And essentially, it was a fabulous conference. It was great for me to get good insight into what people were doing in entrepreneurship, but it really wasn't for all. It was for everybody except for people with disabilities. And every time I raised my hand in a session and I said, well, what do you do to support people with disabilities? They all said, I think there's somebody here who does that. You should try and find them. And after I heard that five or six times, I was like, okay, so clearly this is not entrepreneurship for all. So um, I really realized that, you know, we weren't going to expect that from these other organizations and we would have to try and develop something that we thought was going to work. So next slide. So basically our goal was to educate and prepare aspiring entrepreneurs with disabilities through online training, mentors, ongoing support. This is actually kind of a new take for us. Our initial thinking was that we were going to do this very locally. We were going to do this in the New York metro area and provide in-person training um, to people with disabilities here at the center or in our city office and that people would come to us and it would be great. But the um, when we put out a call for potential entrepreneurs, we got interest from all over the country, even more so than we had from our local area, and we kind of pivoted um, and changed course. So we are actually still in the process of developing all of our um, materials, but we are um, using an online um, accessible uh, learning management system to push trainings out. Um, we have trainers and mentors that are doing live trainings online, as well as videotaping um, trainings that uh, will be provided or that people can go back to. Um, a big piece of our program was partnering with a small business development center um, near us, which seemed to be the model that some of the ODEP programs used as well. Um, it was helpful to us because they're the ones that have all the knowledge. They may not know some specific issues that they need to kind of think about for people with disabilities, but they definitely know um, the entrepreneurship space. So we have had a really great partnership with um, our local small business development center out of New York State University of Farmingdale. Um, and they have provided a lot of training and mentors. And they actually do, um, unlike some of the other ones that we spoke with, have mentors who are people with disabilities. So it was great that we were able to find that connection. 
Um, and then the other thing that we have done is we have created a um, an advisory board of um, mentors and advisors who um, are assisting us with the program. Many of them are people with disabilities, entrepreneurs with disabilities, people in different um, spaces that we thought we would need, like legal and marketing, and you know, um, to support some of our. Uh, you know, trainees as they go through the process. So it was really important to us to be able to provide ongoing training and and mentorship, and that we were actually able to include people with disabilities who were successful um, in self-employment, so that they could really help move people along in a way that you know someone like me who's never started their own business um, could could do. So we really wanted to leverage you know, our, you know, unique place um, in the disability space and combine it with all of the resources that we could put together to support, um, you know, our our first cohort and then going forward from there. Next slide. So some of the highlights that were important to us in creating our program were accessible materials, because that was a thing. Every place we went said, of course we would serve somebody with a disability. And we said, well, are your materials accessible? If you if somebody has a visual impairment, do you um, close caption your videos? Do you have um, sign language interpreters at your, you know, at your training programs? And there was a resounding no to all of those questions in the entrepreneurship world. So for us, it was really important to make sure we had accessible materials, accessible technology. And for us, that meant an online learning management system. And it was very hard to find one that was completely accessible. Um, there really aren't many. And they know that they're not. And most of them are working towards something. But it was, it was a big challenge for us to be able to find uh, a solution for that. Um, we're providing professional benefits assistance and counseling as part of our program. Um, which we think is a really big piece. You know, what do your federal benefits look like? What do your state benefits look like? Um, we really do have great uh, training curriculums and trainers, and we're constantly adding to our um, programs and trying to partner with as many sources as we can. We're currently partnering with um, a veterans entrepreneurship program at UConn um, to kind of bring some of their curriculum into ours and and actually provide them with some assistance um, when they're dealing with veterans with disabilities. And the mentors, like I said, is a really key piece for us. We want to make sure that we have really talented mentors that can help our students um, with whatever challenges um, they are facing. Next slide. Oh, I'm missing a slide. But that's OK. Um, so basically, that other slide is really the highlights of our curriculum. So we we went through a process of what's important. So self-assessment, being able to have people decide what it is they're interested in doing, comfortable, want to do, what is their passion, how do we turn that into something that's a mission statement for their new company, communication, market research, their, their feasibility, how do you develop the product, um, you know, crafting your business plan. And then the last thing, which we're very concerned about and are working with a lot of potential partners to address is the, the issue of capital. You know, where do, where does somebody with a disability who may not have a lot of resources, likely because they couldn't acquire a lot of resources because of their benefits and entitlements, where, where do they get money for startup? Even if it's small startup, you know, where do they get money to help? And, and there are plans out there, part of, you know, benefits advisement is helping with that as well. But our goal was to kind of also find, you know, banks and institutions, investors, um, and we're still in the process of developing that part of our, um, of our program with some of our key partners. But that was important to us, was to be able to um, offer people the ability to have a little, um, you know, assistance with either funding the startup or, or growth or whatever it is that they needed to fund. So that's sort of where we are. So we actually launched, um, we selected our first cohort in October. Um, we have 13 individuals from eight states across the country that are involved with us. They are all in various um, stages of entrepreneurship. Some of them came to us and said, I already have a business. Well, I have a name and I applied to start to form a corporation and but I don't know what to do next. 
Then we have some that just have an idea that they want to do something, but they haven't gone anywhere. Um, so it really is a broad range. And what they want to do is pretty broad. We have a, a couple that are interested in um, starting their own human service organizations, um, you know, or someone that wants to be a fiction writer. Uh, you know, so it really does run the gamut. And we have begun um, online and live via the internet <laughs> training with them um, and linking them up with their mentors that are going to follow them through the training course and providing them with online materials that will supplement their training. Um, so the training really consists of in, you know, in live online training, um, video training assignments that have to be completed and, and return to the trainers for feedback and then working with the mentors going forward. So we, we literally started after we chose our first cohort, maybe two weeks ago, we had our first kickoff call with our first cohort. So we're really, really new in this um, and really excited about the possibilities and the enthusiasm of the, of the first group of individuals that we are working with. So I will stop there. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you so much, Colleen. I and I have a feeling I'm the reason why that slide was missing. So no worries. Nice to you on no that. worries at all. So one quick question. Um, so you have 13 individuals in the cohort now. Mm -hmm. How yep. long is the cohort anticipated to last? 12 to 14 weeks is our plan. And that's really to get through the, the training piece. That doesn't necessarily mean they'll be done at the end. Um, you know, but our hope is that their business plan will be completed. They will at least have researched some ways to get capital and that they've um, applied to to you know start their corporation. So that's sort of where we're where we're looking at at the end of that three to four month period. Awesome. I have a well, I, we got you right out of the gate. Um, <laughs> Absolutely. So we, we might have to have you come back and and report out afterwards I would love to. and bring one of the participants. That would be great. We would love to. Okay. So we'll come back to you uh, during the open Q&A. Sure. Uh, thank you very much. That was uh, great to hear and a very impressive program that you've created. Um, so we're going to move now to Diego. Um, and so I'll briefly introduce Diego and then he can go through um, his organization's model. So, um, so Diego, uh, growing up in Mexico, um, felt the isolation that comes with having a disability and found a community with his Paralympic junior team. Um, who knew that we had a Paralympic junior swimmer from Mexico, right? Um, and that was during that time that uh, Diego found the power of ag advocacy firsthand. Um, they lobbied to replace an inaccessible training center with a new state-of-the-art facility. And then after they achieved that goal, he went on to gain media attention and was hooked on advocacy. And, and so in high school, Diego created a series of disability awareness workshops, and that went um, with uh, across eight schools around the country and then had 20 corporate sponsors. Uh, Diego was accepted to American University and that's how we found him in our nation's capital and um, brought advocacy uh, to the United States to form Together International. Um, this is a not-for-profit startup that supports entrepreneurs with disabilities and moves us closer to a world where disability is recognized and valued as an asset for business and entrepreneurship. Diego is the CEO and Chief Disabled Officer, and in so doing, supports entrepreneurs with disabilities and works with corporations to recognize their value. With that, I'll turn it over to Diego. That was a really good intro. Um, thank you, Derek. Yeah. Um, well, hello, everyone. Thank you for being here. Really excited to be a part of this conversation. I think as, as Derek mentioned, I always like to start the the conversations with the fact that <clears throat> I think I, to quote Lady Gaga, I think I was born this way. I've always been really kind of entrepreneurial and stubborn. Even my mom jokes that, uh, you know, I was born six months and a half into my mom's pregnancy. That's how I developed uh, CP. And so she says that um, I was really stubborn and I wanted to get out. And that's how... And that's why uh, that's why I have CP. Um, but yeah, I've uh, I've always been interested in entrepreneurship, and I think that um, <clears throat> when I was in Mexico, I had the opportunity to start really my first venture before even the word entrepreneurship was 
popular or I guess as popular as it is today. I really didn't think much about the fact that we were starting a business other than thinking that it was a need that the community had and we just had to do something about it. Um, and so we started this, uh, this series of workshops that were around training um, students about disability. So we would do things like eating without being able to see or using public transportation in a wheelchair or communicating without speaking. Um, and then that was a way for students in Mexico to learn more about disability in ways that they weren't learning before. Uh, and so by the time I graduated high school, we were in about eight high schools across the country. 80% of it was corporate funded. And to these days, it still continues to be one of the largest youth led programs in Mexico. Um, and so that was really my first kind of formal experience into entrepreneurship. I really didn't even consider myself an entrepreneur. <laughs> but then I started, I came to DC for college and people started to call me an entrepreneur. And I, at first it didn't really resonate with me. I really wasn't interested in, in business. But as I started to explore, you know, what I had done in Mexico and the, the venture that we had created, and as I started to get more involved in the disability community, I realized that I was an entrepreneur and that entrepreneurship was also a great mechanism to solve, in my opinion, to solve the unemployment crisis that people with disabilities are facing because, you know, as disabled people, we have to figure out how to solve problems every day from how do we get dressed in the morning? How do we drive? <clears throat> how do we communicate? And so all that is a problem solving skills. <clears throat> and so um, all of business is, is really solving a problem at scale. Right, and so what we could translate um, the skills that disabled people have just by living with a disability into a business concept and really kind of elevate those, those skills. And so that's really how Together International was born. Um, I can walk you a little bit through the program. Uh, if we can go to the next slide. Yeah. <clears throat> Like, <clears throat> so this is, <clears throat> excuse me, this is the slide that we would present to uh, to a potential partner investor, but really looking at how has the job market changed and how focusing in the gig economy and entrepreneurship is really a competitive advantage for everybody, not just for disabled people. Um, so this is really meant to say this is where the job market is going. If you're not thinking about entrepreneurship, you're actually behind the, tr the, the trend and behind kind of how society is moving towards that. So what this, this does is helpful because it helps us um, frame the problem much bigger than just the disability perspective. This is where everybody's moving towards. Next slide. Great, so this is where I talk about specifically disabled people uh, and how we <clears throat> have to innovate um, on a daily basis. You can go to the next one. Um, talking about the unemployment crisis and the unemployment crisis that people with disabilities face, um, which we are all familiar with. Um, we can go to the next one. Okay, this is really interesting. Um, I think this puts it in, in context. Again, this makes it from, you know, we're serving a community of people unique that's kind of a niche into this is a much larger market that everybody can be a part of and that everybody's influenced in some way. Um, so this again, helps us go from, you know, kind of short vision to a much larger, scale problem. We can go to the next one. And let me know if I'm going too fast. Our title slide. And really flipping the disability narrative is, is kind of what we think about <clears throat> because <clears throat> we're not trying to fix anybody with a disability 
We're not trying to um, cure them or any way of their disability. What we're saying is use your disability as an asset and use the skills that you've gained as a person with a disability to make your business better um, or to make existing businesses better as well. Go to the next slide. So this is really interesting. So this is kind of the four components of our program. So we look at um, our program really as a workforce development um, strategy program, more so than um, the unique success of the entrepreneur as a, as a business owner, right? So for us, um, um, a good outcome or a positive outcome would be <clears throat> a person went through our program, decided that entrepreneurship wasn't for them, <clears throat> and then based on the skills that they've gained, they now have, are much competitive <clears throat> in the workforce. And because of our program, they're able to gain, they're able to, um, you know, gain quote unquote traditional employment um, at a much competitive rate than before. And so we really look at it from a workforce development standpoint. Um, so the four components of our program are entrepreneurship classes. <coughs> this is, <coughs> excuse me, this is really similar to, uh, I'm guessing similar to the Viscardi Center in thinking about, um, you know, basic entrepreneurship uh, materials, uh, lean startup, things like that. Then the second component is coaching. So this is um, getting the entrepreneurs to realize that they already have all the skills that they need to succeed. So it's a lot about sort of self-development. And, and it's it's more so, it's, it's less about telling them how to do a particular thing. And it's more so having, that, having them figure out the answer for themselves. So this is, I think, has been a particularly uh, unique uh, aspect of, of our program. And what we see, what's really interesting about this is um, we might frame it in a business context, right? When we do the coaching sessions because they're focused on a business. But once the entrepreneur achieves a certain level of self-confidence, they're able to translate those skills that they've gained in coaching and in the entrepreneurship classes outside of their their unique business. Um, so that's really interesting, um, an interesting trend that we've seen. Um, the, the third is peer-to-peer -peer support network. And so this is really peer-to-peer um, -peer support groups, um, kind of what are you working on and how can we help um, type thing. And then the other is information and referral services, which goes in line with benefits counseling and or mental health related disabilities, or uh, if somebody needs um, accessible housing, we try to provide um, at least referrals to additional services that may not be related to entrepreneurship per se. Um, and I think one thing I forgot to mention, we do these um, purposely uh, and sort of in person all, and the reason we felt like this was important was because <clears throat> it created a sense of community and camaraderie um, that is difficult to replicate um, online. At least for us at this early stage, we felt like it was really important to see um, the progression of the members that we serve um, kind of face to face. Can we go to the next slide? So this is a little, um, I have to update this, we've done more than that, but um, we have a, we have um, about 214 members so far. We've started, I believe, we started our meetup in um, 2000, I wanna say like 2017, maybe 2006, I have to go back and see. But it's been a couple of years to get us to this point. We also, um, We've also, um, it took us a long time to figure out that like this was the right path to take. Um, it, it's what we, in the entrepreneurship lingo, I guess is what we would call it kind of 
discovery or LVP model where we're kind of trying different things to find product market fit. So it took us a long time to figure out like this was the right path. Um, but uh, it's really exciting to see the membership grow. Um, and so our programs, we provide our, our programs um, on a, the meetup, the peer-to-peer -peer support group, that one we do on a monthly basis. And then the other groups, the other programs, we um, we do whenever they're there, whenever we see that an entrepreneur needs particular services. Um, what's unique about this time around, and I forgot to include it in the slide, but what's unique about this time around is that we're actually accepting also a cohort of people in uh, in 2020. Um, if we can go to the next slide, I think. And there should be yes there we go so this is the program that i that i'm going to talk about now so um so <laughs> so far so far we've been doing the programs whenever people need support um but <clears throat> we recently received a grant and a, a donation from an individual donor that's going to allow us <clears throat> to take 12 participants and be able, oh, not 12, sorry, um, six participants, because we got less funding, so we needed to do less um, less people, but six participants and move them through um, three months of support and be able to track, you know, how, how they're developing um, throughout those three months. So can we go to the next slide? This is some of the people that we've worked with. Um, if you can go to the next slide. Our team, I think, is really unique because it's made up of entrepreneurs themselves and also entrepreneurs with disabilities. So it's a, it's really a unique mix of people that I think um, challenges and kind of make us better. Um, yeah, and I'm really excited to to um, see how this cohort goes. And um, uh, we were talking a little bit before the call that we had a. A meeting this morning with uh, potential <clears throat> applicants for a program for the cohort program that's starting in 2020 and it was really interesting to see the diversity and the um and the different programs that they're the different ideas that they have and the different stages that they're at and so um so it's a really exciting time to be able to see um uh, so far we've We've provided the services sort of whenever we we found that somebody needs uh, assistance, and whenever there there's been, um, I guess, flexibility in time. But now it's going to be consistent support. And one thing I forgot to mention is that um, our entrepreneurs will actually be receiving a stipend from for the duration of the program. Um, because as we talked, financial resources, uh, as we as we all um, heard before, can be uh, difficult for entrepreneurs with disabilities in particular. So we we've made it a point for our program to uh, give people a, a stipend that they can use as seed funding for their pro for their for the duration of the program. Uh, if we go to the next slide, I think it's the last one, and that's it. Um, so I'm excited to answer any questions during uh, the Q&A. Thank you very much, Diego. That was great. Uh, Janelle, can we go back one slide, please? Um, so not to take away from the description of your program, and but I think um, I'd be remiss not to mention something here because it connects back to Barbara Butts. So the reason I know Diego is because of Barbara. So Barbara really brought Andy Arias to Washington through an initiative that she was working on with the team called Career Access. And Andy was an advisor. So he came to Washington to do some um, uh, I guess policy wonk work to try to find new pathways, um, not to social security benefits, but to an alternate path that would be career access that would fund people to work rather than to benefit. Because of that, Andy somewhat landed at the Office of Disability Employment Policy, which is his formal job. Informally, he's on the side advising Diego. So Andy, Diego, and I met, I don't know, about 18 months ago and talked about this work. 
I'm we owe that all to Barbara. So exactly. I'd like to mention that. Pretty cool. Susan would call it a synchronistic bounce. Um, Small world, huh? Yeah. All right. So now we have uh, the Viscardi Center model, and then we have Together International's model that's um, currently working in Washington, D.C. Is that also in Mexico? Uh, in Me no. So we will eventually, I think, do, do a version there because I think so much of what I learned in Mexico when I started my first venture, I've taken here and I've used those skills here. So I would like to take a version of what we're doing here and take it back there. What I learned through my first, I guess, entrepreneurship endeavor is sometimes cultural, you know, sometimes a program can't be translated perfectly culturally speaking. So we'll have to make some, we'll have to learn and make some tweaks as we go, but it'll be really interesting to see how, how we're able to take some of the learnings here and apply them there at some point. Awesome. All right, thanks, Diego. We'll be back to you and Colleen after Alex's um, presentation here. So let me now uh, introduce Alec Frazier, our third panelist. Alec Frazier is an autistic disability rights advocate, the director of Autistic Reality, and is the author of two books, Without Fear, The First Autistic Superhero, and Veni Vidi Autism. For his work at Autistic Reality, Alec does public speaking, lobbying, peer advocacy, and publicity, as well as other forms of advocacy. Amongst uh, many of the uh, areas of work that Alec has been up to, he's spoken on Capitol Hill. He's mentored um, for the AAPD Summer Internship Program class. He's supported and uh, the passage of major legis legislation and has appeared and spoken on multiple conferences and conventions. Uh, important to me is um, Alec uh, is also an inductee of the Susan Daniels Disability Mentoring Hall of Fame as part of the class of 2018. That was our last class. And um, importantly to me as well, we're joined by two other individuals that he was inducted with as part of our first mentoring circle, Terry Hartman Squire and the J.D. Michaels. <laughs> Welcome to J.D. to his first mentoring coalition meeting. Um, so he was inducted as an entrepreneur um, and uh, for um, sharing practices with other individuals in that mentoring circle to impact and change the work that they do as well. So Alec, we look forward to learning more about your work in autistic reality, reality and of course your ever expanding practices. Over to you. Well, hi everyone. I'm Alec Frazier and let's feel the force. <laughs> I've got a purple lightsaber right here. This is my home office and this is where I work. And I work where I feel at home and where I feel comfortable. I actually work around the world wherever business takes me. Um, and uh, and I want to say first, Der Derek touched on something. I am not technically a disabled entrepreneur. Yeah, I have like around 15 disabilities. But my entrepreneurial work is not about disability so much as it is about things that uh, that anybody uh, can't, well, theoretically can do, but it, it's difficult. It's all about the connections. It's about who you know and, and the connections you build. And I'll talk about that. Now, I have this presentation here. And I may elaborate on points as I did just now, but I also want to make sure that it's accessible to people who are blind and low vision. So I have my own copy, which I can send out to whomever, which has accessible captions. The first slide has a, a my logo and uh, the, the logo, okay? The words are in black text, except for the few, uh, it, it says autistic reality. The words are in black text, except for the first letter of each word, which is in yellow text. The beginning of each word is in a red lens, which has bubbles coming off of it towards the top of the latter part of the word autistic. And the idea is that it is viewing reality through a lens. Next slide, please. Thank you so much. Um, I only have like three or four slides of content because I didn't want my cup to run it over, but it's wonderful, wonderful content. 
So this is uh, Veni Vidi Autism, my current book and stories about us. If you click on Veni Vidi Autism, you'll find the link to the Amazon page. Um, there's also the cover of my book uh, on the other side of the page, and I'll read the description here. Uh, it says, the front cover of my book, Veni Vidi Autism, it is a picture of me in a navy blue cloak in front of a red canopy topped by a golden shield and eagle in the old Senate chamber of the United States Capitol building. My arms are stretched upwards, and there is blue lightning streaking upwards from my hands. In front of my torso is a red speech bubble with jagged edges that says in text that fades from yellow to orange, top to bottom, Veni Vidi Autism. Below this in orange is my name, Alec Frazier. Across the top of the cover is a black band that says Volume 1. Uh, for the record, how did I get this photo? Uh, I actually asked my senator's office. Senator Chris Van Hollen is a dear friend of mine, and I asked his staff, would you mind if I, I brought a costume into the U.S. Capitol building and posed as the emperor from Star Wars? And they said we'd actually encourage that. <laughs> so that was uh, pretty darn cool. Um, so let's see. A couple of years, as of a couple of years ago, I had generated a lot of content for my previous blog and for academic papers, as well as a number of interviews. With the help of my fellow Disability Mentoring Hall of Fame inductee, J.D. Michaels. Hi, J.D. Uh, sorry, <clears throat> the J.D. Michaels. Um, I was able to help get myself set up as a publisher and became a copyrighted author of my book, Veni Vidi Autism. For the record, I was already set up as an author of the first book, which was more of a pamphlet, and that's been folded into this one. Using the same process, JD and I are publishing a number of other disabled authors as part of the Stories About Us anthology. It's very, very important to note, and, and I'm holding my finger up to, to make a point here. It's very important to note that these stories are not all about disability. Rather, it is the authors who identify as disabled. Uh, they remain in absolute control of the works and make 100% of the profits from the works. Um, the goal is to remove the barriers that people have had uh, in in publishing, and the disability community has had a tough time with a lot of things, including publishing, uh, I should say, our work. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, this is my, my work is, it's work, it's really busy, but it's also really fun. So this is a picture of me with the, I, I'm not lying here. I'm not exaggerating. This is me with the head of Marvel Entertainment, Joe Casada, who's actually a dear friend of mine. I met him several years ago, and we've stayed in touch, and we message now and again. And I asked him if he would be willing to sit for a podcast interview, and he said yes. Um, uh, so it says, Alec is very tall with glasses and a wide-brimmed black hat. And Joe is a little sh shorter with short, dark brown hair and glasses. Both are smiling. Um, this, this, uh, this, uh, this is also on my YouTube channel. Um, so for podcasts, I interview a wide variety of guests for my podcast, the Autistic Reality Podcast. If you click that, you'll be taken to the SoundCloud uh, channel for for my podcast. Guests so far have included politicians like Chris Van Hollen, business owners like Virginia Ali, who's the co-founder and owner of Ben's Chili Bowl, uh, one of the most famous Black-owned businesses in the world. It's here in D.C. Um, artists, writers, actors, and major talents and decision makers in the entertainment fields. Um, I... Uh, uh may point this out on another slide, so forgive me, but I also have YouTube interviews of Joe, as seen here, and of, I'm not lying here either, Diana Gabaldon, the author of the and creator of the Outlander saga. <laughs> um, I, I actually, it, it, remember when I said it's all about who you know? Well, 
I have taken the tag, and this isn't on the slides, so listen careful, carefully. It doesn't hurt to contact celebrities via social media. You'd be surprised at how many would under, would, would respond. I emailed Diana about whether she wanted to be on my podcast, and then I posted that email, uh, the part I, I was privy to share, uh, on my Facebook, and holy crap, she responded to that, and she said, I'd gladly sit for your podcast, and we have uh, like 20 minutes of interview up on YouTube and my blog. Um, although mo almost all of the questions are tailor-made to the individual guest on the fly, one question is constant. Terry Hartman Squire, I love you dearly, and I know you're listening, and I thought of you when I composed this question for my very, very, very first podcast ever, the one with Chris Van Hollen, and I have asked it of every single guest afterwards, and I've done dozens of guests this question is about disability representation in the entertainment industry, whether it be acting, writing, illustration, or something behind the scenes. It doesn't matter if the person has nothing to do with entertainment. I ask them that question because I want to get a broad cross-section of, uh, of, of what uh, celebrities and movers and shakers and, and pioneering people have to say about disability and entertainment. Because thanks to Terry, that has done a lot for me. And I feel like I should return the favor. Next slide, please. Right on, Alec. So um, this is actually a picture of me at work. I was compensated for this. I kid you not. It's a picture of me at Disney World, at Pandora, the world of Avatar. Um, the key is knowing people who will compensate for various things and and have it uh, regarded as a business endeavor. Um, I'm going to read the description. Alec is pictured in a blue t-shirt wearing glasses in front of a floating mountain covered in rich foliage and waterfalls. There are various other plants around him. And actually, I don't know if you can see it in this photo, but some of the plants are alien plants from that fictional world in the Avatar saga. And the news the next film will be coming out in December 17th of 2021 and it'll be about the underwater world of that planet um so blog entries i am just restarting uh my my personal or advocacy blog you can click there and it only has one entrance uh, i I'm, i had a blog that had everything imaginable on it and now i'm trying to curate it more carefully um, it has one entry so far, which is actually a version of this presentation made accessible so anyone can view it on, uh, on Blogger. I also have frequent thoughts on entertainment and put them on Vaini VD Autism, a pop culture blog of autistic reality, which is another blog on Blogger, and that has at least three entries so far. Um, both blogs are just restarting, but will be frequently updated with new content. I also put the occasional video interview and other uh, wonderful stuff on my YouTube channel, along with other content. And you did see in the uh, cover of my book that I was I imitating the Emperor from Star Wars, I actually had my senator's staffer film me impersonating the emperor from star wars and uh and that was uh really wonderful and they actually did that on the floor of the u.s senate <laughs> i'm i'm a bit nutty but i love it um okay next slide so those are the three videos on youtube pop culture criticism this is my biggest field of work in the day to day um i'm going to uh uh read you the uh caption for that so I have to go to my pro presentation. Um, me and my protege, protege uh, I have a number of mentees. This is the closest mentee to me. Her name is Liz Pritchard. And we're speaking to about 200 people at New York Comic Con 2019. Thousands of people applied to give talks at that con. Only about two dozen were chosen. 
Liz and I are at, at, at a table in the foreground of the front of a large room, and there's a large varied audience in the background. I am on the far left at the bottom of the photo, waving my hand, and Liz is slightly to my right. I have short brown hair, glasses, and a dark gray shirt and light blue shorts. Liz has medium length light brown hair and light sunglasses. She is wearing a black jacket and dark pants. So um, uh, I write pop culture articles for a number of outlets, including Flickering Myth and Starburst magazine. Um, I also write for my blogs and, and various other things. Articles range from reviews to opinion pieces to works on sociology and entertainment. Not all of my pieces are about disability. In fact, most of them are not. Remember, I mentioned I'm an entrepreneur. I have disability, but not all my entrepreneurial work is about disability. I will be starting a podcast for Flickering Myth, which will include works from the Autistic Reality Podcast. I also travel the country and the globe giving speeches on the role of disability in general and autism specifically and the, their representation in entertainment and pop culture. Next May, I'll be going to Toronto for my first international speaking gig. Venues include academic and disability conferences, as well as pop culture events such as Comic-Cons. I've been to a lot of Comic-Cons, and I've got some fascinating guests at them. So next slide, please. We're almost done. This is, uh, this is my, uh, hang on, I, I lost it for a sec, my contact information. I know you're going to think this is very personal for me to give out, but this is my, my home is my business address because I travel so much and I'm okay with working from home. And, uh, and this is me holding my book um, and a smiling guy in his early thirties with brown hair, glasses, and one hell of a forehead schlubby, I dare say, holding a book in front of him, cover facing forward. And I, I did want to say uh, you can be, uh, well, I'll say this at the end. So that's my, my phone, email, website address. Next slide, please. And let me find the file uh, again. Yeah, thank you. This is, uh, this is a, a social media. Now, this is a picture of my workspace where I actually am right now. There's a my uh, lightsaber, which uh, feel the power of the force. Every disabled person has the the ability to tap into a force of, of unlimited potential, and you can become your own action hero. Yes, this is actually a uh, an action figure I have of myself. Thank you, JD. That was a wonderful, wonderful gift, and uh, and. I, I tell everybody you can be absolutely successful. So I'm just going to go over the caption, and you can read this stuff on your own. I want to have this sent out to you, but I want to make sure people know what's in the photo. So uh, the photo of my workspace is a seven-foot beanbag sofa with giant pillows set against a wall of memorabilia related to my first book, Without Fear, the First Autistic Superhero. The memorabilia include action figures, original art, copies of the book, a copy of the work it reviews, and photos of auto and autographs of people involved in the work the book reviews, such as Joe Quesada, Charlie Cox, Alex Milev, and Stan Lee, of all people. Um, above all is a banner promoting both my firm and the book, also included in the photo are Star Trek badges, my lightsaber capability, and, and a, a stuffed astronaut Snoop, Snoopy symbolizing our journey home to the stars of whose dust we are made. We are all stardust. We are golden. Alec, awesome. Thank you very much for your words, and I uh, appreciate your description of all of your activities and I've got four or five questions that have popped up um, just from your description there. Um, but I would be remiss to not say that I asked three people from completely different organizations to go through about 15 minutes of content. 
And I don't know how you did it, but we are exactly on time. So without a doubt, this is my favorite panel I've ever been involved with. Neat. Let's open this up and um, get some questions coming in. So we've heard now from um, three different programs, three different approaches, and importantly to me, three different organizations using entrepreneurship to design, launch, and uh, impact others in entrepreneurship models. Uh, pretty cool. Um, I have some questions, but I'll, I'll hold mine and see if we can get some others coming in, either through the chat box or um, through uh, the audio. So I'll pause there. Does anyone have a question? Derek, this is Joe. Um, question. Uh, first of all, I want to say all three presentations were awesome. Loved it. And uh, Alec, I, I loved your uh, descriptions for sure of your images. But um, for Diego, Diego, I, and I may have missed it, and I'm, I'm sure I did. Um, did Is your program offered to all disabilities? I, I just wanted to make sure I understood. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, thank you for the question. Yeah, we actually, we do uh, offer it to all disabilities. The philosophy that we've taken is looking at disability from an identity perspective. So actually on our application, we just say, do you identify as having a dis as a person with a disability or as disabled? And we don't ask anything else from that. Um, and the purpose of that is we look at disability from an identity perspective. And so um, whoever chooses to self-identify as having a disability is welcome to be part of the program. And then for our meetup, What's interesting about our meetup, since it's a public uh, group, anybody can join, but you'll see that the title of the members are actually disabled entrepreneurs. So that's purposely designed to alienate people who are not, <laughs> who are not disabled entrepreneurs to not join because we want to make sure that as close as possible, we stay with the market of people that we're supporting. Sometimes we get uh, people that are not disabled entrepreneurs and that's fine too but we want the market uh, of our meetup to be just disabled entrepreneurs thanks for awesome. the question joe thanks diego looks like dylan is typing a question in the meantime um, does anyone else have a question for the panelists hi derek this is janelle i have a question for colleen and diego um i agree <laughs> it was a great panel my question is Diego mentioned that sometimes um, folks will go through the programming and realize that entrepreneurship isn't for them, but that what they've learned makes them uh, a, a stronger candidate in just a general work environment. How do you all approach um, collaborations with businesses or other types of programs that do employment placement if indeed entrepreneurship isn't the right um, the right next step for the individuals you work with. You want to go first or should I go first? Uh, go ahead, Diego. Sure. Um, so that's a great question. Thank you for asking it. So we, <clears throat> so that's actually a revenue model strategy for us. Um, so we'll partner with organizations and, um, and say, you know, we'll, we'll get a cohort of people and then we'll track their development. And then those who are not, uh, who chose not to continue entrepreneurship um, can be a referral for you for um, employment. So, so that's kind of the way we think about it. Um, and also from our information and referral services, uh, we'll continue to work with the, with the individual um, to help them find an alternative pathway. So for us really a success is to get um somebody employed whether it's it's through self-employment or traditional employment i mean the focus the, the the core of our work is is entrepreneurship but if somebody who joined our program realized that they don't want to continue in that path we'll do our best to help them uh, find a, another uh, opportunity and i think my answer would be similar to diego's we you know we provide at Viscardi Center, we directly provide employment services um, for people in our region. So for people that are in our area that need assistance, we can definitely offer to provide those services. 
We also have developed relationships in several other states so that we're able to really understand where to refer people if they're not here um, geographically. And we also, through um, the National Business and Disability Council, which is another piece of the Viscardi Center, we have um, connections with employers across the country, and we actually have an online job board. So we're encouraging our entrepreneurs as well as anybody else, and you can feel free to send your individuals there as well, um, <laughs> you know, to sign up for our job board so that they have access to jobs across the country. And, and the um, companies that are looking there are specifically interested in ensuring that people with disabilities are represented in their workforce. So, and we're actually gonna launch a new job, a much more comprehensive job board um, in January or February of next year. But we have our, um, if you look at uh, nbdc.com, um, you should find the link to our job board. I just wanted to say, I know this question wasn't technically for me, but uh, it's not like I, I don't totally have a, uh lack of this. I did work in independent living for years, and uh, I am a disability advocate by training and by trade. And so I often refer people to various resources, uh, often based on my own experience, but also that I've heard, heard good recommendations for. And I'll certainly refer some people to you kind folks as well. Right. Thank you all. So we have another question that's come in from Dylan. Uh, it's online. I'll read it. Colleen and Diego, again, going to the Viscardi Center and Together International. And then, Alec, feel free to compliment as you just did. What is the Viscardi Center and Together International doing to promote activities and offerings outside of the New York, New Jersey area, or in Diego's case, in the Washington, D.C. area? So Dylan's down in North Texas and wondering, and, and represents a lot of people in Texas through one of the commissions, governor's commissions, I believe there. So people are need to be aware of what you're doing. There's a major increase of modeled entrepreneurship programs and businesses being developed by either orgs, families, and people with disabilities or persons with, or by persons with disabilities. So um, why don't we start this time with Colleen? I know that you have a national like connection already, so you can describe that, and then um, we'll go to, to the others. Absolutely. And again, our stuff is available online um, at uh, the viscardicenter.org website. You'll find our National Center for Disability Entrepreneurship there. Um, and we did um, do a tremendous amount of marketing to find the first cohort, but obviously we haven't, we haven't reached everybody. So anybody that wants to spread the word, feel free. Um, but also we did try to reach out to some of the national organizations like AAPD and um, to try and see how far reaching and I and we did fairly well we you know we got interest from eight states um, I think as far away as California um, so uh, we would be happy to um, support people in Texas um, they just have to visit the website they can put in a uh, fill out the interest form we are now focused specifically on entrepreneurs with disabilities so we got a lot of calls and interest in family members that wanted to work with their family member to start um, a business. And we are actually thinking about doing a separate kind of offshoot um, to kind of tweak the program so that it would uh, more uh, adequately serve those people. So it perhaps could be a, 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 a business started by a family, one of which the people would have a disability, um, but the person with the disability may not be the one engaging in all of the training. So we're looking at, at a different model for that group. Thank you, Diego. Sure, um, so for us right now, we're just focused on DC at the moment and it's something that <clears throat> I personally struggle, you know, as, as a person who grew up in Mexico, my first thing is like, let's go international. Um, but we felt like, focusing hyper local at the moment will allow us to create a model that could be uh, replicable in different states and different communities at some point. Um, so at the moment, we're just focusing in DC. Uh, but what I try to do is I try to participate in calls like this or, you know, with the State Department or, you know, other kind of broader communities to talk about the importance of disability and entrepreneurship broadly. Um, but in terms of the people who we serve, we're currently just serving people in DC. Thank you I very have, much. Al, Al, go ahead. I have people I advise all over the country and in fact, around the world. 
and not all of it's uh, uh, super formal clients. Sometimes it's friends who need help with something. Um, I, if I can in any way help them, then I do. Place is not uh, is not an issue. I, I've helped people in Germany and uh, in Texas and in uh, Oregon. And as you know, I'm going to Toronto next year. Um, <clears throat> some of these people are like Facebook messaging. Some of these people are people I actually talk with on the phone. It doesn't matter where they are. I, I, I hope this doesn't come across as bragging, but I like helping people. You it's know, it doesn't true. matter where they are. You know? That's great. Thank you, Alec. Uh, I, I mean, what we're addressing here is so systemic that if we aren't all helping each other, then we are going to lose another generation to tracks of unemployment. So everyone's work, your work, Alec, and the work at the Viscardi Center and Together International is critical to open up a new employment pipeline option for people that choose that. So Dylan, I hope that helps and feel free to reach out. We'll, we'll be sharing the contact information afterwards. Um, so. I'm going to ask my question now. I think it's one that I talk about frequently, and it came up a little bit. So we'll start with Alec on this one. Um, Alec, you somehow attract the attention of uh, the rich and famous. And this is not a skill that most people have, but it's an important one for entrepreneurs that are taking risks and need to find and connect with people. So what are your recommendations to the entrepreneurial spirit in all of us? How do we make the ask? Listen, uh, just I'm going to say this crassly, but have the balls to actually contact them. <laughs> and, and, and to, you know, like uh, when uh, Anthony Rapp went on uh, Star Trek Discovery, I had seen him in Rent years ago. And, uh, and I actually messaged him on Facebook and he actually responded, and we, we chat from time to time, and I share my opinions about the plot lines he's in, and, you know, he uh, he actually agreed at some point he'll sit down for an interview with me, and I told you about how Diana Gabaldon literally saw a Facebook post I made, and she sat down for like 20 minutes with me, and uh, I my very first book reviewed a work by the comic book author Brian Michael Bendis and Bendis is a, he's a great writer but he's big for his britches and so he actually didn't uh get back to me but I'm like ooh I could go to his boss and so I found that Joe Casada was having a meet and greet at Fan Expo in Toronto and I actually met with him. I told him what I'm doing. He's like, holy crap, we got to work with you. So I had some meetings with Marvel Editorial and uh, at their offices in New York City. And I've actually met Joe a number of times since then. I was a uh, guest at the uh, premiere of the Marvel exhibit at the Franklin Institute. And uh, we, we chatted then. And then before New York Comic Con, I asked... I, I messaged him. Now, I, I can always get a response from him, but it might take a few tries because he's got thousands and thousands of followers. So you got to get, you know, make sure that you aren't being annoying, but that these people notice you. So I, I messaged, I like sent like, hey, mind, mind if I ask this question? Or I asked the question like three or four times on, on his private messenger. And like twice I put something on his Facebook wall saying, I sent you a message. Uh, would you mind uh, sitting for an interview? And I said, no, I, I can do that. And as a result, uh, myself and JD was actually my assistant for the day. And uh, I know he's laughing like silly right now. Uh, J JD and I actually got special passes to VIP passes to Joe Casada's panel at New York Comic Con, where he had he interviewed, not getting you here, Vincent D'Onofrio, and uh, you know, it's just be to get in touch with these celebrities. Go out of your comfort zone. I'm autistic. I I have had social disability my entire life. The entire reason why I'm doing this this talk instead of sitting in a room by myself all day is because I've learned to push my social limits, you know? 
and, and 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 you can learn from that to actually uh, contact these, as you said, celebrities. I've gotten to know a lot of them, and they're just really good people, you know. Thank you very much, Alec. All right, so let's go to Colleen next. Colleen, you know, in your courseware or lesson plans, mm -hmm. you know, what's the what's the the message there to participants? How do you find the courage to to go out and push yourself? Oh, that's good. Um, I think we do a whole section in the very beginning um, about a personal mission statement um, and kind of, you know, helping people to figure out who they are and who they want to be in the world and what is the message that they want to push out to the world. So I think it's more than just, you know, I'm going to start a business and sell a product, but it's how are you connected to the product? What does that mean for you? Um, and I think that we've spent a lot of time because a lot of entrepreneurship programs don't have that component. Um, so we've actually spent the first like three or four sessions are on that topic of, you know, what is your passion? What is your personal mission statement? How do you communicate about yourself um, so that people feel kind of empowered um, to get through the rest of the, the training and the process? Excellent. Thank you. Diego? Yeah, so this is actually, to me, this is one of the most interesting questions because it's like, I think the basis of all of our work. So we come at it from saying, you're already an entrepreneur. You already have the skills that you need to succeed. Um, all we're doing is morphing those skills and, and translating them into the business con context. So similar to what Colleen was mentioning, I, at the beginning of our work, we'll, we'll talk about, uh, we don't do like personal missions, but we'll do acid mapping. So things like what assets do you currently have that you can leverage? Mm -hmm. um, and that's helpful, especially for people who are low income, um, you know, have other marginalized communities that they're a part of to think, to do that exercise of what assets do I currently have, even if I don't have the experience or the uh, connections, but to start to think that even at any level, we all have some assets that we can leverage. Wonderful. Well, thank you very much, Diego. I appreciate that. And there's a theme here of, um, you know, creativity, innovation, but also consistency and persistency. Mm -hmm. um, and um, perhaps we all have those things, but we don't see them in the world of work. We see them in other areas of our lives. And you all are helping others find that. Um, and to me, that's helping them find an entrepreneurial purpose. And sometimes we skip that stage. And when we can find that, then normally um, we find the energy to, to create and to do great things. So I appreciate your content um, and your presentation and answering the questions. I do want to add in now some content from the University of Illinois at Chicago. Go ahead, Diego. I have one question, though, for Co Colleen. I'm, I'm dying to ask. To oh, ask. no. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. So question. So I guess two questions. One is, uh, what are you guys measuring? So what are the metrics that you're using across the different lessons? So that's one. And then the other, and I know we talked a little bit about it when, when we met, but I'm curious if you have people in DC that you're supporting. And I ask this because I think it, they could benefit from both programs, um, especially since we're doing yeah, no, as far as people in D.C., we actually don't. Um, maybe, <laughs> maybe that's because you have them, Dean. <laughs> but no, we don't have any people in D.C. or the Maryland, Virginia area, which is interesting um, because we actually took a look at that. Um, and then I forgot the other part of your question. Oh, what 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 metrics are you using to oh, measure that throughout the program? Yeah. Well, we're, we're obviously measuring how many participants. We are keeping some demographic information, um, not a tremendous amount. Um, we're measuring whether people get through completion of their business plan, who gets funding you know, for their projects, who actually launches their businesses. And our goal is to measure them on the, you know, uh, longitudinally as well so that we can see in a year to two years how, how are people doing and what kind of supports do we need to to um keep them successful <clears throat> got it 
Good question, Diego. Thanks for bringing that up. Um, well, with this, I am going to proceed. We're at um, six minutes to our time, and I wanted to make sure that we provided a few resources out of the Uni University of Illinois at Chicago, the SEED program. Colleen had mentioned them. So in their model, uh, Dr. Kate Caldwell is actually teaching right now. Otherwise, she would have joined us as well. Uh, but you can find their model online. It's an interdisciplinary effort coming out of um, funding from the Coleman Foundation. It works to bridge entrepreneurship and disability by developing and implementing um, you know, an education and training program. Um, the reason I wanted to refocus on SEED was because they have a new online tool, and I think, um, I'm not sure if you're aware of it, but it complements these other models that are, are happening. Let's go to the next slide. The Idea Lab. So all you need to do is Google U-I-C-C-E-E-D, and this is the education uh, development idea lab and it's cool there's three phases to it and I think you can you know either point people to it to use the whole model and take what they like or go through it yourself and then use some of their ideas in your own work um, the the first one is a, a, a meter and it's a analysis tool where it's a Q&A and it will give a rating uh, from their perspective on where you are as a person uh, as an entrepreneur with a disability are you ready do you have ideas formed um, and then with that, the next phase is a uh, learning tool. Um, I haven't watched it. They have about a 27 slide uh, presentation. Um, I watched it and fast forward. Um, and it's interesting, it'll take you through um, kind of phases, similar to Diego's, um, I think, support model and the Viscardi Center support model, um, but another model uh, that's online. And in some places, we don't have access to full scale programs. This one is a condensed online version. And then the last phase is the grow section. So I recommend checking that out online. Um, next slide. Um, importantly, this time of year, it's in, uh, we have options as we shop. And so today I'd like to suggest buying from entrepreneurs with disabilities this holiday season. Um, the uh, Kate Caldwell uh, and the uh, seed team partners with another friend of ours, Emily Ladau out of New York, uh, and words I wheel by, to create the annual holiday gift guide. And um, these entrepreneurs were previous contributors, but I mean, who doesn't want a no more craption shirt for the holiday? <laughs> so you could go online and buy one of those and provide that to a gift. Um, and I encourage you to explore that if you're interested. One Next. year for Christmas, I got my entire family three love shirts, you know, uh, disability heart, mom, dad, and brother. See, there you go. Great gifts and support entrepreneurs with disabilities. Texas is represented there, correct, Dylan? And Mark Bartlett there, it doesn't say it, but he's with Accessible Gamers, and some of us are supporters of his work as well. Next slide. Um, so, so the, the panel, we were going to do those slides before we've had the panel. So let's go to our next slide and we're going to wrap up the discussion with a few mentoring coalition updates. Um, and so this wraps up our meetings for the year, but we look towards January. And so I'm going to ask Janelle Thomas with PYD and my partner in crime and running the coalition to provide uh, an update on the mentoring hall of fame. Janelle. Yes, thank you. Uh, well, it's hard to follow these three incredible panelists, but I'll do my best. We are really excited about the results of the National Disability Hall of Fame uh, this year, the nomination cycle. And thank you to all of you. Many of you submitted nominations as well as promoted the Hall of Fame in your social media circles. And we're so appreciative. We had over 53 nominations this year which is really incredible. Um, the nominations are from across the country, all kinds of various um, organizations and individuals, a great diversity in um, disability, geography, background. And so it's gonna be a really stellar uh, class of 2019. 
we will be uh, the selection. There's a selection committee that's working on um, choosing the class of 2019. And on January 17th, you all will have a front row seat to the class of 2019 Hall of Fame webinar that happens to be uh, being held on International Mentoring Day. So I hope you all will be there cheering on our new um, Hall of Fame um, inductees. And as always, you'll be able to find each of their bios on uh, www.disabilitymentors.org. I will write it in the chat feature for those of you who would like to see that visually as well. So thanks a lot. Awesome. Thank you, Janelle, for leading this year's campaign for the Hall of Fame to recognize mentors and mentoring programs around the country that are having positive impact on the lives of youth, young adults, and adults with disabilities through the power of relationship. Um, we have some Hall of Famers with us, and uh, the opportunity here is to do our first, we did this in October last year, um, an online announcement, um, but the reason we're bringing it up is it will serve as our January monthly meeting, and we'd also like all of your assistance in letting the country know that this is going on. So um, we will be sharing uh, some content that you can put out through email lists uh, and on social media. And we would love for you to help advertise that. Um, we will use this same platform and it will serve as a 90 minute uh, um, award ceremony. And we will have some guest speakers to include some new inductees to the Hall of Fame. Importantly, January is also National Mentoring Month. If you uh, have um, not been familiar with that, please. Um, do so and get your organizations to participate. January 8th is I Am a Mentor Day, and January 30th is Thank Your Mentor Day. Both of those days, the world gets engaged on sharing mentoring stories. Um, and so if your organization is on social media, um, I, you could plan in advance. Uh, we recognize that Mentor, our partner, Mentor the National Mentoring Partnership, leads this effort. And you could go to their website. I previously shared with our members the campaign guide, but they have plenty of social media tools to assist your organizations. Um, also, the National Mentoring Summit is in Washington on January 29th. If you're in town, please let me know. We can get some of our members together. Um, two other updates. Um, we have a peer mentoring webinar. We were planning to do that. Um, Next week, it is going to be pushed to a new date, um, likely towards the end of January. We'll provide the update to everyone through email. And last, um, we will have our first quarter of calendar year 2020. Um, all of the network members, which we have now about 70 of, we're going to send out a Survey Monkey request to, for you to populate, and we will use that content to create a more robust online directory. So, folks like Lydia, who's out as a 17 year old in 45 minutes outside of Oklahoma City, who's looking for a mentor because her community told her as a person with a disability she could not be a nurse, could find a directory of people that will lead her to more positive influencers that allow her dreams to come true. Yes, I spoke with yeah. Lydia and her mom last night, and it was a shame that this was going on, but it's going on everywhere. Derek. Yes, Regina. Regina. Oh my goodness, this just boggles my mind. We have on the board of PYD an amazing nurse who uses a wheelchair. And I've, I've met her. Only, yeah. So Lydia will be talking to Manu directly. And Manu is going to talk to Lydia about how her dreams can come oh, true. Perfect. Perfect. I mean, Manu has, has a PhD in nursing and, has, and uses a wheelchair in did the whole academic arena in becoming a nurse as high as you can become one. It's yes. just amazing that she, yes. And then there's Sherry Blowout, who's an inmate, who's a medical doctor and uses a wheelchair. And it's just mind boggled to think about that to me. I, yeah. Yeah, so that's why we want to put it. out a more, that's why we're going to put out a more robust directory. Lydia's dad yes, had enough and Googled her. and found me. And now we're getting Lydia aligned. So we could do that for a lot more people. And we look forward to your participation and filling out that form. Well, it, we're now three minutes past our time. So I'm going to have to wrap okay. up today's conversation. I'd love to take five seconds to thank our panel 
Diego Mariscal, Together International, Colleen Crispino from the Biscardi Center, and Alec Frazier from Autistic Reality. You guys were awesome. We're gonna re you. we recorded this. We're gonna caption it, and then we'll share it um, for distribution. We'll also share our panelists' accessible files, so you can reach out directly to them. And with that, um, from Janelle Thomas, Regina Snowden, and myself, we thank all of you for joining us today. Have a wonderful ap afternoon and happy holidays to everyone at the Mentoring Coalition. Take care. Have, have a wonderful day, everyone. Fantastic Bye, session. I look forward to sharing. Thanks, Joe.